In this video, we'll be exploring geometric symmetry and the concept of a mathematical group. Symmetry is a concept that we all have an innate understanding of. We can all identify objects possessing high degrees of symmetry, and there is something inherently pleasing about highly symmetric objects that we might find, say, in nature, as we walk around cities and look at symmetrical buildings, in art, and even objects that we find in everyday life. We can all easily distinguish these types of objects that have high symmetry from objects that have low symmetry. But what exactly is symmetry? If asked to define symmetry, most people use words such as sameness or balance, but be hard pressed to come up with a precise definition for symmetry. For our purposes, we're going to use the mathematical definition of symmetry, which states that symmetry refers to the degree with which an entity, some object, a mathematical function, or really anything, is invariant under some geometric operation. These geometric operations include rotation about an axis, reflection through a mirror plane, inversion about a point, and even doing nothing counts as a symmetry operation. Molecules have distinct three-dimensional shape, so molecules also have symmetry. Our primary interest in molecular symmetry lies in the fact that molecular symmetry will dictate chemical bonding. Because it dictates chemical bonding, it also dictates the spectroscopic properties that molecules possess and their reactivity. To get us to start thinking about symmetry, we're going to consider this equilateral triangle and ask ourselves the question, how symmetric is this two-dimensional equilateral triangle? Now inherently, we look at this object and we can see that it has some degree of symmetry about it, but trying to quantify that degree of symmetry is a little bit difficult. A way in which we can do this is to simply count the number of manipulations that we can perform on this object and return something that looks identical to what we started with. One operation that we've already stated that we can do is nothing to it. This is a symmetry operation, so there's one symmetry operation right there, do nothing. In addition to that do nothing operation, we can also think about rotating this triangle about an axis that corresponds to the centroid of the triangle. To see how, what happens as we rotate this object, I'm going to label the vertices A, B, and C. And what we're going to do is a 2 pi over 3 rotation. So just remember that 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees. When you do that 2 pi over 3 counterclockwise rotation, A goes to B, B goes to C, and C goes to A. We can do a further 2 pi over 3 rotation, converting C to A, A to B, and B to C. Doing a third 2 pi over 3 rotation brings us back to where we started. Now, this third 2 pi over 3 rotation is the same exact thing as that do nothing operation. So this doesn't count. That do nothing operation will take precedent over that third 2 pi over 3 rotation. So, so far we have one ro operation with the do nothing and two rotational operations. In addition to those operations, we also have reflections through a mirror plane. We can draw a mirror plane that bisects the C angle and inverts A and B. We have another mirror plane that bisects the A angle and intercoverts C and B. And a third that bisects the B angle and intercoverts A and C. So we have a total of six symmetry operations. So a way in which we can quantify how symmetric this is is to say that there's six symmetry operations that we can perform on this two-dimensional equilateral triangle. We can compare that equilateral triangle to a hexagon and ask how much more symmetric is one object relative to another. Just looking at these, we inherently know that that hexagon is has a higher symmetry than that equilateral triangle. But going through and counting up symmetry operations, we can quantify this. As we said, 
that equilateral triangle has six symmetry operations that can be performed on it, the do-nothing operation, two rotations, and three reflections. The hexagon has 12 symmetry operations that can be performed on it. The do-nothing operation, five rotations, and six reflections. Therefore, we can say that the hexagon is a higher symmetry object than the triangle. We can lower the symmetry of that hexagon by placing some lines on it. So for example, we can generate these two different hexagons, one that has six lines on it and one that has three. To differentiate these two, I'm going to label them A and B. We can now ask ourselves the question, how much less symmetric are these hexagons than the one that we just explored, and how do their symmetries correspond to the triangle? Well, hexagon A has six symmetry operations, a do-nothing operation, and five rotations. Placing those six lines at the vertices has eliminated those mere planes. Hexagon B also has six symmetry operations, a do-nothing operation, two rotations, and three reflections. We can say that the triangle and hexagons A and B are equally symmetric with one another. However, modified hexagon A possesses different symmetry elements than the triangle, while the triangle and hexagon B have identical symmetry elements. If we were to group together the symmetry elements of these objects, what we could say is that the triangle and hexagon B belong to the same group of symmetry elements, but A belongs to a different group of symmetry elements. So what we're now getting into is the mathematics of grouping together objects and operations. This falls under the branch of mathematics called group theory. Group theory is an enormous branch of mathematics that deals with the algebra of, well, groups. It has a lot of different applications in a huge number of fields, including multiple branches of mathematics, cryptography, music theory, robotics, physics, and chemistry. Before we start to go into how we can apply group theory to chemical problems, we have to go through and discuss a little bit about the fundamentals of group theory, specifically what is a group. A group is just defined as a set of elements that when equipped with an operation, some mathematical transformation, obey the following set of rules. The first is that the product, so if you do an operation on any two elements of a group G, it'll return another element that's also a member of that group G. The second rule is that one of the elements of group G has to be an identity element, and it must commute with every element in that group, leaving it unchanged. So if you have some element A, and you perform the operation with the identity element. That's the same as taking the identity element and performing that operation with A and returning member of the group A. The third thing is that something called the associativity law must hold for each member of group G. So if you take elements A and B and you operate them together, you get a different element of the group you take that element and you operate it on C, that will give you the same thing as taking elements B and operating it with C, taking that element and operating it with A. The fourth thing that must hold is that every element of the group G has to have a corresponding element that is this reciprocal element or its inverse, such that if you take that element and perform the operation with the reciprocal element, it's the same as taking the reciprocal element and performing the operation on that element itself, and that will return the identity element. A non-trivial example of a group is a set of positive and negative integers which are related to one another by addition. So the group corresponds to the set of integers that range from negative infinity through zero all the way up to positive infinity. Going through our rules of a group, First, every single product of any two elements of the group G is also a member of that group. So for example, if you take one 
and add two, you get three. Three is an integer, it's a member of G, and this holds for every single element of the group. There's an identity element, which is zero. So for example, one plus zero equals zero plus one, which equals one. This holds for operating zero on every single member of the positive and negative integers. The associativity law holds for G. So if we take one plus two, add those together, we get three. Three plus three equals six. That's the same as taking two plus three, adding those together, getting five. One plus five equals six as well. And this holds for every single element. Lastly, every single element of G has a corresponding reciprocal or inverse element. It's just the negative of whatever that integer is. So for example, one, its inverse is negative one. One plus negative one equals negative one plus one, which equals zero. So you get the identity element back. The specific types of groups that are important in chemistry are called point groups. A point group is a set of symmetry operations that satisfies the rules of a group, all of which will leave one point in an object unchanged. To give you an idea of where we're going, I'm going to talk about this molecule PF5 briefly. PF5 is a molecule that's contained in trigonal bipyramidal geometry. We can define a central point in the molecule that rests at the center of the phosphorus atom. If you were to go through and add up all the symmetry elements found in PF5, you would find that there's 12. There is something called an identity element. It's the do-nothing operation. There's two different rotations that you can do around the axial axis. There's three rotations that you can do in the equatorial plane. There are mirror planes, one that's perpendicular to that axial rotational axis, and three that contain the axial rotational axis. And there's also two additional rotations, or something called improper rotations. If we take all of these, we can form a set. This set of symmetry operations obeys the rules of a group, and that group we define as being the D3H point group. In the next video, we're going to define these different symmetry elements and symmetry operations. And in the video following that one, we're going to combine those symmetry elements into groups and learn how to assign point groups to molecules.